Our first objective is to find the velocity of the second ball after the collision. Let's take a look at a picture that represents the given information. Each ball has the same mass, which we have labeled M. Initially, the first ball is traveling horizontally towards the stationary second ball. Notice that because the second ball is stationary, its initial velocity is zero. We then have the collision, and the first ball travels off at an angle of 30 degrees, and the second ball travels off at some unknown angle with some unknown final velocity. Now, this is a two-dimensional collision because each ball at the end of the collision is moving in both of the x and y direction. And so what we need to do is take the final velocities and break them into x and y components. We will begin with the final velocity of the first ball. Perhaps we can draw in the x and y components first. The x component points horizontally to the right and the y component points vertically upward. We need to find their values. Let's start with the x component. We'll notice that the x component is adjacent to the 30 degree angle. Because it is adjacent to the 30 degree angle, we will use the cosine. So we can say that the final velocity for ball 1 in the x direction is going to be the 4.33 meters per second multiplied by the cosine of 30 degrees. And this ends up equaling approximately 3.75 meters per second. We will next find the y component. Notice that the y component is opposite of the 30 degree angle, so you would use the sine function. So we'll multiply the velocity by the sine of 30 degrees. And we end up getting 2.165 meters per second. So we'll label those on the diagram, and then we're going to move on and find expressions for the final velocity of ball 2. Now, ball two is interesting because we do not know the final velocity, nor do we know the angle. So the best that we can do is just set up expressions for the x and y components for ball two's final velocity. So for example, the final velocity of ball two, the x component, is adjacent to the angle. So we would take the final velocity, which we don't know, we're just calling it v2 final, and just multiply it by the cosine of that unknown angle. And then similarly, the final velocity of ball 2 y component is going to be opposite of the angle. So that's going to be the final velocity of ball 2 times the sine of the angle. So this is the best we can do for now for ball 2. Now what we need to do after breaking these up into their components is just focus on those x and y components. You may even find it useful to sort of discard the original velocity and angle and then to also discard that original velocity and its angle because all we really need are the components and what we do with those components is conserve momentum. We're going to conserve momentum first in the x direction. So let's set up a conservation of momentum which basically just says that the total initial momentum is equal to the total final momentum and we're going to do that right now so we'll set it up. Now let's recall that momentum is basically just mass times velocity. So we have the initial momenta of the balls on this side and the final momenta of the balls on the other side. And again, we're just focusing on the x direction right now. So we've attached these little x labels just to remind ourselves of that fact. Now we know that initially ball two was stationary. So its velocity in the x direction initially was zero. That drops this term out of the equation. And then notice that the masses are all the same. So we have represented that mass with m. That would actually divide out in each term of the equation. So we can actually cancel out the masses as well and simplify the equation further. Now, initially, ball 1 was moving horizontally to the right. So its x velocity was 5 meters per second. And then a moment ago, we had calculated the final velocity of ball 1 in the x direction. If you want to go back and look at that, that was the 3.75 meters per second, so let's fill that in. And then as for the final velocity of ball 2 in the x direction, remember we had expressed that as the final velocity of ball 2 times the cosine of that unknown angle. So what we're going to do is actually solve for that last term, and we can do so by just subtracting the 3.75 meters per second from both sides and we end up getting 1.25 meters per second is equal to the final velocity of ball two times the cosine of the angle. So this is an expression that we're gonna hang on to. And meanwhile, let's go over and conserve momentum in the y direction next.
So here is the momentum conservation in the y direction. Notice this time we have used little subscripts of y to denote y direction. Once again, we have some key observations that the mass is going to divide out. So we can actually cancel it out in each term. Now, similarly, we can cancel out a lot more because if you think about the original scenario, we had the ball, ball one, moving exclusively to the right and ball two was stationary. So think about the velocity in the y direction of ball one as well as the velocity in the y direction of ball two. And you should hopefully realize that those velocities were zero. Ball one was not moving in the y direction initially and neither was ball two. So the initial velocities in the y direction are both zero, which means on the left side we'll have zero plus zero for the momentum and that just reduces down to zero. Next, let's recall the final velocity of ball one in the y direction was the 2.165 meters per second. And then the expression we developed for the final velocity of ball two in the y direction was the final velocity of ball two times the sine of that unknown angle. And what we're gonna do is solve for that last term just like before. And to do that, we will subtract the 2.165 from both sides of this equation. Canceling it out on the right hand side and now we have negative 2.165 meters per second is going to equal that final velocity of ball 2 times the sine of theta. Now that is our second equation and we're going to do something quite neat with the two equations that we've developed so far. So let's stack them on top of each other. We have this equation as well as the one we boxed in earlier. You'll notice we have put the y equation on top and the x equation on the bottom, meaning the equation developed using conservation of momentum in the y and then conservation of momentum in the x. And the reason we're stacking them is because there's a neat algebraic trick that we can perform here. If we divide the equations by each other, so if we divide negative 2.165 by 1.25, we get negative 1.732. If we divide the right sides, the v2 finals will cancel, and then we're left with sine of theta divided by cosine theta, and we know from trigonometry that that is tangent of theta. So this is neat because we're gonna be able to solve for the angle theta. Now remember in this situation to solve for the angle, you actually have to do the inverse tangent of both sides of the equation. You don't divide by tangent, which is something I hear often. You take the inverse tangent of both sides to cancel it out on the right. And when you plug the left side into your calculator, you're going to get negative 60 degrees. That's going to represent the angle that is part of the answer to this question. We also need to go back and solve for V2 final. And we can do that by taking perhaps this equation. You can also use the other one, but we'll choose to use this one to solve for V2 final. We'll go ahead and plug in the angle that we just figured out. And then finally, we will divide both sides by the cosine of our angle. And when we do that, we can actually cancel out the cosine on the right hand side, punch that into your calculator and you will get about one point, excuse me, about 2.50 meters per second. That is going to be the final velocity of ball two and the other part to the answer to this question. Now there was another follow-up question. If we head all the way back, the question asks something about what type of collision. Okay, so we're done with part A. We found the velocity, both magnitude and direction, but part B wants to know if the collision was inelastic or elastic. So let's talk about how we can figure that out. Now, if the collision was elastic, then the initial kinetic energy of the balls would have to equal the final kinetic energy of the balls. That's the definition of an elastic collision. So what we're going to do is calculate an expression for the initial kinetic energy of the balls and then we'll do the same thing for the final kinetic energy and if they're equal then the collision would be elastic so let's set up the initial kinetic energy of the balls now of course kinetic energy is one half times mass times speed squared so we've set up the initial kinetic energies of both balls remember that ball two was not moving the initial velocity of ball two was zero so we can actually take off this term right here and then for the other one, we would have one half times mass times the initial velocity of ball one, which was five meters per second squared. And if you punch in one half times five squared, you should get 12 and a half. So we're gonna have M times 12 and a half 
and then we squared velocity, so it's actually meters squared per second squared. We can't actually plug in a mass because we don't know it. So we'll leave it as that and move on to the final kinetic energy of the two balls. And then we'll start plugging in for the first ball. The final velocity was 4.33 meters per second squared. And then for the second ball, we had calculated its final velocity was two and a half meters per second. And then we'll square that as well. Now, when we simplify this term here, we're going to multiply one half by 4.33 squared. And we get about 9.37. So we'll have m times 9.37. Again, this is meters squared per second squared. When we multiply 1 half by 2 and a half squared, we get about 3.125. So we'll have m times 3.125 meters squared per second squared. And then when you add those together, lo and behold, you will get m times about 12.5 meters squared per second squared. So we have this expression for the final kinetic energy, and then we have the exact same expression for the initial kinetic energy, because they're the exact same, they're equal, the collision was elastic. And that concludes the answer to this question.